We have just uh, one more reading this morning from the Arcana Celestia, a work for the new church. And this is describing the necessity of having a, an idea of who the Lord is. And that if we don't have a, a proper idea of who the Lord is, we cannot be conjoined to heaven. So let's read this passage. This is from the Arcana Celestia, number 4211. When a person is joined to the Lord, they are not joined to his supreme divine itself, but to his divine human. For a person cannot have any idea at all of the Lord's supreme divine, because this lies so far beyond anything they can conceive of that it fades from view altogether and ceases to mean anything to them. But they are able to have an idea of his divine human. For everyone is joined through thought and affection to one of whom they can have some idea, but not to one of whom they cannot have any idea. If, when a person thinks about the Lord's human, holiness is present in their ideas, they also think of the holiness which comes from the Lord and fills heaven. Amen. When you think of the Lord or about the Lord, what do you see? Who do you see? How do you picture him? For some of us, it may be hard to have a concrete image of him in our mind. And it can be even more difficult given the fact that we can so often think of the Lord in terms of abstract notions like love and wisdom. While it is true that the Lord is love and wisdom itself, that doesn't really help us form a picture of him in our mind. We can only understand what love and wisdom are when they are applied to a human subject. So how do we see the Lord? And why is it so important? This is the subject for our sermon today. It's about how we can see the Lord in our lives and in our mind. Our text taken from John chapter 14 does not appear to immediately address this issue. Rather, it tells us of the promise the Lord is keeping and forming our spiritual home. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many uh, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. The two ideas I want to focus on right now are about belief and preparation. How are these two things related? In the work for the new church, the apocalypse explained, it says that to believe in the Lord is to believe that he regenerates people and gives eternal life to those who are regenerated by him. However, in our story, it almost seems like Jesus is asking the disciples who he's with to believe in God and himself as if they were two different people. But we know this isn't what he is saying. Rather, he is telling them to believe in both a deeper part of himself as well as the human being they see with their physical eyes. This deeper aspect of the Lord that they're being called to believe in, called God in the story, is what is known as the Father. The Father is the Lord's love. And as we mentioned, this love cannot be comprehended apart from his human manifestation, who is Jesus Christ. So the Father, or the Lord's love, is what wishes for us to have these heavenly homes that we've been speaking of. But it's the Lord's wisdom that ultimately achieves this goal. So let's reread this verse from John, thinking of God as love and Jesus as truth. It says, You believe in God or the divine love, believe also in me, the divine truth. I go to prepare a place for you. Our regeneration process is closely linked 
to the formation and preparation of our heavenly home. And this is why the Lord speaks of this preparation immediately after telling the disciples to believe in him. The disciples in our story represent everyone who is a part of his church. Or in other words, they represent everyone who wants to go to heaven. So our regeneration, or how we get to heaven, is the slow and steady formation of our home there. And our home is built, of course, on the quality of our lives and our idea of God. So the heavenly doctrine for the new church teaches us more about these spiritual homes. A passage in the Arcana Celestia says that the place a person has in heaven is determined by the state of life and faith that is theirs. Our idea of God is the most important idea that we can have. The writings for the new church say that our idea of God partly determines the nature of our home in heaven. And it also informs, it also forms our understanding of all things of religion and life. The story from John continues. The Lord says, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Notice how the Lord, in the beginning of that sentence, says, If. His promise of a life in heaven is indeed conditional. It's not conditional on his end, but it is conditional on our end. So the Lord isn't saying, I may or may not prepare a place for you in heaven. His goal, of course, is for all of us to live in heaven. And that will always be his goal. But in order for his goal to come to fruition, we have to want that as well. And that's what the Lord means by if in that sentence. And everyone responds to the Lord's goal in different ways. For instance, if we think about the structure of heaven, the angels of the celestial heaven technically want the Lord's goal more than the angels of the spiritual heaven, which is a heaven lower than the celestial. So one passage from the heavenly doctrine says that it's the Lord's will for us to live in that highest heaven. Because when we're in the highest heaven, we're the closest to the Lord. And that's what the Lord wants. He wants us to be close to him. But for those who don't want to live in the highest heaven or even the spiritual heaven, the Lord still receives those uh, people, those spirits. He receives even a natural angel which would be the lowest of the heavens, even if that isn't what the Lord wants most for that angel. So we see it's simply a matter of how much we want the Lord's goal for ourselves that determine where we end up in heaven. He still goes to prepare a place for us, regardless of where we end up. So in our story, the Lord then continues and says, "...in where I go, you know." and the way you know. Thomas responds to these words and says, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? So who do you think Thomas might be in our lives? Let's think about John chapter 20. In this chapter, it's been about a week since the Lord has risen, and the disciples, some of the disciples have already seen him, but Thomas hasn't. And the disciples tell Thomas that he has returned. But because he had not seen the Lord for himself, he doubted. Thomas in John 20 says, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Like doubting Thomas, there is also a part of us that doubts and is unsure. Thomas here in the story represents that lower part of us that is most connected to our sensory experience and our natural life. It's the part of us we're experiencing right now at this very moment, the natural degree of our life. 
And we hope that this degree, the degree that we're conscious of right now, is connected to our spiritual self, which we are not conscious of. This natural Thomas part of us isn't bad, but it can easily be led astray, and it needs guidance. The Thomas in us, like the Thomas in the story, sometimes needs physical, tangible proof of something before we can understand and believe it. So when Thomas in the story from chapter 14 asks, how can we know the way, we see that for us, there is this doubting, sense-oriented part of us that still needs guidance and still needs reassurance. So the Lord responds to Thomas and the rest of uh, his disciples. He tells them that they already know the way. Remember, this story from John chapter 14 takes place near the end of the Lord's life on earth. By this point, the disciples who have been with him for quite some time have already learned everything, or, or rather most things, that the Lord has taught them. But still... They were confused. They knew what to do. They knew the big teachings of the Lord, but they were still confused. So we can often feel the same way. We know the way to heaven. We know what we have to do to get there. One of the prevailing teachings in the new church is to repent from our evil. We must examine ourselves, shun our evils as sins against the Lord, and do what is good. This is what we have to do. And we all know this. And yet, how easy is it to lose sight of that very simple message? And this is why the Lord's response to Thomas's question, how can we know the way? This is why it's so simple. His response to Thomas, the Lord's response, is told in two different parts. He first says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. His answer here appeals to this sensory, lower Thomas part of ourselves. Perhaps in our story it doesn't look like that, but if we look to the spiritual sense, we can see that it really is true. It does appeal to our natural life. So let's consider the Lord's statement of the way, the truth, and the life. The way, in this verse, refers to the Lord as doctrine, or in other words, his teaching, his teachings from the word. One passage from the heavenly doctrine for the new church says, everything included in the doctrine of true faith looks to the Lord and looks also to the heavenly kingdom and the church and to all things of the heavenly kingdom and the church. The Lord is doctrine itself as regards truth and... So I invite you to consider the implications of this teaching here. It says that the doctrine of true faith looks to the eternal goal of heaven and the Lord alone is regarded in this doctrine and is the doctrine itself. He is the way. In a practical sense, we can bear this as a basic principle in our mind. Whenever we read from the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the Heavenly Doctrine for the New Church, we can ask ourselves, how is the Lord leading me or leading us in this particular teaching? This is a a very good practice, especially when we encounter teachings that are difficult for us to hear. Instead of thinking, This is too difficult to accept. This can't be true. We can ask ourselves, how is the Lord showing me the way to heaven in this teaching right now? The Lord then says, I am the truth. The truth here refers to an acknowledgement of truth. We can know many things about the word and yet not recognize them to be true. Knowing things is simply a matter of the memory. But an acknowledgement of truth comes from us living those teachings from the word and really believing or realizing that they are indeed from the Lord. 
He says next, I am the life. The life in this verse is the goodness that we receive from the Lord when we have that acknowledgement or real faith in him and live according to his word. So remember, this response uh, of the Lord to Thomas is appealing to our sensory natural life. So in our own lives, when we live in the way or his teachings from the word, we come to acknowledge the truth of those teachings. And we are then blessed by the life he imparts through those things. So as we walk the way, the truth, and the life, we can imagine it leading directly to our home in heaven. However, this still doesn't answer the question proposed at the very beginning of the sermon. Our heavenly home is based on our lives, which we've talked about, but it's also based on our idea of the Lord. So how do we picture the Lord in our mind? The second part of the Lord's answer to Thomas deals with the way that we can see him in our mind. He says to Thomas, No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Remember in the beginning of our sermon, uh, the Father here refers to the Lord's love. And Jesus, who the disciples are talking to, refer to his truth. No one comes to the Lord's love except through his truth. So we can think about the Lord when he was on earth. When he came to earth, he came in the form of a man. He reordered the heavens. He regained control over the hells. And he glorified his human that was originally from his earthly mother, Mary. And as he went through this process, his human became less and less merely natural and more and more divinely natural. And when he became the divine natural, he became something that is divine, but is also something that we can relate to. He retained that human form that we can see and understand. And because of this, we can now picture the Lord as a man in a conscious and perceivable way. Not a mortal man like us, but a divine man. In fact, the one and only divine man. If you remember our reading from the Arcana Celestia, it really clarified the importance of having a human image of the Lord. We'll read it again. It says, When a person is joined to the Lord, they are not joined to his supreme divine itself, but to his divine human. For a person cannot have any idea at all of the Lord's supreme divine, because this lies so far beyond anything they can conceive of, that it fades from view altogether and ceases to mean anything to them. However, they are able to have an idea of his divine human. For everyone is joined through thought and affection to one of whom they can have some idea, but not to one of whom they cannot have any idea. So, if a person, when uh, they're thinking about the Lord's human, holiness is present in their ideas, they also think of the holiness that fills, uh, that which comes from the Lord and fills heaven. So hopefully now we can understand what the Lord meant by no one comes to the Father except through me. Of itself, the supreme divine, which the passage we just read speaks of, it is completely incomprehensible. We can't understand it. And this is what the Lord says about his internal self, the Father. We can't relate to anything that we cannot comprehend. And just as we can't understand what love is, apart from someone who is doing the loving. But when love, like the Father, is applied to someone comprehensible, it can then be understood. 
And this someone who we're referring to is the divine human who is Jesus Christ. Through our idea of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are then joined to his love, the Father, the supreme divine. So Jesus' answer also, uh, his answer to Thomas, also appeal, uh, appeals to our sensory life in a tangible way. It appeals to our conscious mind. It's not difficult to have an image of a human being in our mind. And that is exactly what the Lord accomplished by putting on, excuse me, by putting on the divine human, our visible Savior. He gave us that concrete image that we can comprehend. So our idea of the Lord is very important. We know that he is in the word, and this is how we interact with the Lord physically and outwardly, by reading the word and living according to what it teaches. In our mind, however, we don't imagine him as a mere book. We imagine him as a man, a human being. He has a body, just like ours, with hands, arms, and feet. But he is more than just a mortal man. He is the Lord, Jesus Christ, the divine human that regenerates us and prepares us for our heavenly home. The Lord's love, the Father, wills the creation of this home. And it's the Lord's wisdom, Jesus Christ, who builds our home. For unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Amen.